Thank you for laughing. Um, so I actually, I thought long and hard about whether or not to give this sermon to this crowd on this Shabbat, um, because I'm going to reflect on my 25 years uh, in Jewish education. I'm going to be receiving my honorary doctorate on Monday at uh, my alma mater at Hebrew Union College uh, in Jewish education. And the message that I want to share is, uh, as Rabbi Brown and I were whispering to each other, sometimes the ra role of the rabbi is to comfort the afflicted, and sometimes it's to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> I may be doing some afflicting tonight, but you're the right crowd for it. Rabbi Harold Kushner, often best known and associated with his landmark and transformational book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, died last week. Rabbi Kushner, Alava Shalom, was one of the great Gedolei Hadur, one of the great minds and thinkers and leaders of his or maybe any generation. His book, whose title is so often misremembered and misquoted, so often misquoted as why bad things happen to good people, to which I once heard him say, I can't write that book because I don't know the answer. Incorrectly, the title is actually When Bad Things Happen to Good People. That book sold more than four million copies, which for Jewish books is a lot of copies in at least 12 different languages. And I alone probably account for a few hundred of those sales, because during my 25 years as a professional Jewish educator, a milestone, as I said, I'll celebrate on Monday, I have given away countless copies to students and congregants. And if you're among the handful of North American Jews not familiar with the book, order yourself a copy, read it and then make an appointment to talk about it with myself, with Rabbi Brown, with Cantor Cohen. In fact, hold on to that very suggestion. Read a Jewish book and discuss it with your rabbis or Cantor. If you take nothing else away from my sermon this evening and it's only that, then what I had hoped to achieve will have been successful. But in truth, I'm hoping to achieve more. Because it's actually not Kushner's well-known book that had the most profound impact on my own Jewish thought and professional life. Rather, it was an article that he penned for his own synagogue bulletin, their version of the shofar, in Temple Israel of Natick, Massachusetts. The article was about what he titled The Crisis in Jewish Education, and he wrote it decades ago, 40 years ago, and it has shaped my rabbinate ever since. This is what he wrote to his congregation in their monthly bulletin. This might be the part that you find afflicting. In the beginning, you came to us, the rabbis and Jewish educators, and you said to us, quote, teach our children to feel proud about being Jewish and to care about it. And we said, the rabbis and educators, no problem. Judaism is so exciting and inspiring a guide to life that we will invite your children to be part of it with minimal difficulty. And then you said, quoting, in that case, let me make it a little harder. Teach my child to feel proud about being Jewish and to care about it, even though we live in a community with so many distractions, so many conflicts on Saturdays and on Jewish holidays, no real Jewish environment outside of the synagogue. And we, the rabbis and educators, replied, that will be harder. But give us enough time, good teachers and textbooks, and we will try to overcome those problems. And then you said, I'll make it harder still, Rabbi. Teach my child that being Jewish is one of the most important things in their life, and let us teach them that it's one of the least important. You teach them to take Jewish values seriously, and we'll make light of them. You teach them to ask, what does it require of me? And I'll teach them to ask, what does it cost? And let's see who wins. And then we answered, if that's the way you want it, then that's how it will have to be. But it's not fair. We won't teach a child that their parents are wrong or to find fault in what they see at home. Even if we tried, a child will side with home over their school in a conflict of values every time. All we can do is to try our best and ask you to ask yourselves, what did you have in mind when you set up these rules of this game? In case you missed the not-so-subtle rebuke and hypocrisy that the rabbi is pointing out, 
Jewish education, in his view, is hard because Jewish educators are so often being thwarted by Jews who don't model or practice what they claim to hold as valuable. Now, that's a pretty chutzpahdik statement to make in a synagogue newsletter. I guess if you're Harold Kushner, you can get away with it. He sold four million copies of his book. But as the son of a former temple president, I can only imagine the phone calls that Temple Israel's president got that week when the rabbi's article came out. And I say that the article was transformative, inspiring for me when I began the process of becoming a Jewish educator more than 30 years ago. Because in it, he crystallized, the article crystallized, the challenge that I have spent my professional and spiritual life trying to overcome. How do you teach any Jew, child, teen, or adult, that Judaism, that being Jewish, is one of the most important things in their life, when all around them, family and friends and society at large, champion secular values, pop cultural norms, and a general rejection of anything associated with Jewish life as they might bleakly remember it from growing up in their own Hebrew school days. And so for me, confronting that challenge begins with a question. Education, for what purpose? What are we educating Jews of any age for? Is it to maintain tradition so that we can ward off disappointment from our parents or our grandparents? Are we doing it out of guilt because Jews died in the Holocaust or died to establish the state of Israel? Are we doing it so that our children can lead a B'nai Mitzvah service and we can check that box on the Jewish report card or scorecard? Maybe we send them to Jewish day school or summer camp so that they will marry somebody Jewish. Those are common reasons, but they're not good reasons. We are educating ourselves and our children about Judaism because a Jewish way of life is a meaningful way of life. Full stop. Why be Jewish? So that you can live Jewishly. To live Jewishly is to see the world with Jewish eyes, to live by Jewish time. The words and teachings of our tradition become the background music of the story of our life. And this sacred covenant, this tradition, informs our choices, our actions, our values, how we live, how we work, how we play, and how we pray. Nothing else, in my experience, does that so thoroughly and so rewardingly as Judaism. Not yoga, not veganism, not wealth, not higher education or learning. And those are all wonderful things in their own right, but they are all products of the underlying Jewish values, the underlying values that Judaism gives my life and that I believe it can give yours. And so as I reflect on 25 years as a Jewish educator, I realize that I am grateful that my life's work has been to help you see the value in that. It's the first challenge in Rabbi Kushner's bulletin article. Rabbi, teach our children, teach us to feel proud of being Jewish and to care about it. The difficulty, as he well articulates, is that many are not convinced that Judaism is all that important or that it's more important than all the other measures of societal, educational, and economic success that society has on offer. I think Judaism is the clothing, is the armor that we wear to survive and thrive amongst the elements and forces that work against us in the world. Some see it simply as an ill-fitting suit out of style, out of fashion, restrictive, threadbare. I see it otherwise. Now, before I decided to become a Jewish educator and a rabbi, my father offered me the opportunity to follow in his footsteps and to take over the family clothing business. I know, Jews in the Shmata business. It's not a new story. I would have been actually the fourth generation of my family to sell suits and sport coats. Until he retired, I had never paid retail. That I'm proud of. 
I worked after school and summers in his stores. I drove the delivery van, causing a large pileup on a 101 freeway in San Francisco. He never pushed me to, to take over the business, but it was clearly on offer if I wanted it. But I realized working in his stores early on, selling suits and sport coats, that I didn't want to be in sales. Little did I know that that's exactly where I ended up. <laughs> Instead of spending my days trying to convince you to try on and then buy a new suit, I'm trying to sell you on a Jewish life in all of its varied applications and definitions. And I've come to love it. Just like my father actually loves selling suits. It's just that styles keep changing, and so my Jewish inventory is constantly changing too. And it's so hard to stay ahead of the curve. To continue this analogy, when everyone wears suits, it's easy to sell suits. In a Jewish environment, it's easy to sell Jewish. But as societal trends change, when casual Fridays become casual everydays, or work from home in your sweatpants and t-shirt, I either have to change you, the customer, or I have to change what my store is selling. And to take that analogy just one step further, online shopping changes everything. It's hard to summarize 25 years of Jewish sales philosophy in a 12-minute sermon. But if I could quote one person, it would be actually Steve Jobs. When he said, quoting him, some people say, give the customer what they want, but that's not my approach. Our job is to figure out what, they've, what they're going to want before they do. I think Henry Ford once said, if I'd asked customers what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. People don't know what they want until you show it to them. That's why I never rely on market research. Our task is to read things that are not yet on the page. That was Steve Jobs. That innovative and entrepreneurial approach has guided my work. If there is a criticism of me as a professional, as a Jewish educator, and there are many, but if there is one that I genuinely embrace, it's that I never met a successful program that I didn't want to try. Right, Rabbi Brown? <laughs> that I didn't want to try for my congregation. I love good ideas, and I have been so blessed to work with such talented professionals that tolerate my approach and, my, and our partners with me to implement what I hope becomes a shared vision. I don't always get it right. I am not superhuman or prescient in any way. But I am often willing to try, and I am always trying to learn from our successes and our mistakes. But here's the secret to whatever monochrome of success I've enjoyed as a Jewish educator and as a rabbi. Make the customer, the salesperson. The student must become the teacher. The secret to a successful and transformative Jewish education is you, all of you. And that's why this congregation on this night of our next B'nai Mitzvah class is the perfect congregation, the perfect customer for this message. You are the customers for the next year. And you're in the store. In the book of Deuteronomy, just two chapters before the Shema and the Be'ahavta, which appear in the book of Deuteronomy, there's a verse. And make them known to your children and your grandchildren, goes the verse. In context, Moses is telling the Israelites in this verse to make known to their children and grandchildren the events of the Exodus that we just talked about at Pesach the revelation at Mount Sinai that we're going to celebrate at Shavuot. Together with its laws so that they will revere God as long as they live on earth. The Talmud, that wonderful collection of Jewish argument and debate, trying to get to the point of the point, uses this verse to claim that it's not only parents, but also grandparents who have the duty to teach the Jewish tradition to their descendants. And so maybe the most critical piece of a positive and sustainable Jewish education is practice what you preach, or practice what I preach. 
The whole point is that our values should reflect our actions and vice versa. Now, we, of course, know this to be true in our day-to-day -day life, but there is no reason why it, shouldn't, why it should be separated from our spiritual and our Jewish life. In fact, the more integrated they are, the more authentic we are to ourselves. Modeling the values and the practices that we claim to be so important to us that we schlep our kids, force our kids, use whatever adjective you want to go to Hebrew school, to study for the Rebbe Mitzvah, is the best mode of Jewish education. Modeling is the best mode of Jewish education. Nothing sells better than seeing how good that suit looks on someone you admire and wanting to wear it on yourself. Make the customer the salesperson. No matter our age, we watch how our parents live or lived their lives, and we model our own life to embrace the good examples and to reject the stuff that we found lacking. We do that throughout our lives. Children who interact with their parents and their grandparents to any degree, and certainly those who see them often, come to know them in all aspects of life, including the way that they express their Jewish identity. In this Jewish grandparents play a particularly important role. The Talmud teaches when a child is taught Torah by a grandparent, it is as if that child received it from Sinai. My wish for all Jewish families then is that more and more Jewish parents and grandparents and Jews by choice and those that are Jew adjacent and children and grandchildren Experience such a loving and informative and reconfirming experience such as that every single week. So let me conclude by returning to where I began. The lifestyle that I am selling does not hang on a rack. It's in a book, a scroll. And look, you're already in the store. And you're going to be here for the next year. So try it on. Read it. Model it for your family, the people that you love and care about. Come and discuss it with us. I can tell you that you need it. I can tell you that it looks good on you. I can try to make the sale. But we, we both know it's only when you take it home and when you look at yourself in the mirror, when you see how it fits you, how it makes you feel, it's only then that you will know that you have acquired something beautiful and indispensable, transformative and life-changing. Practice what you preach. Try it on. You'll have never looked or felt so good. Shabbat shalom. Thank you.